All attendees to hear you. This system will notify you once you begin your broadcast. Okay, welcome everyone to the August uh, 2019 edition of the HR Best Practices webinar series by Thompson Co. My HR Genius. My name is Kevin Mosher. I'm a, a certified labor and employment uh, law specialist and manage our um, Minnesota office uh, for Thompson Co. And um, I'm really excited to present this webinar to you this this month a um, couple couple things with these webinars if you are if you are new to them welcome uh, it's really great to great to have you we've been doing this webinar series for six years um, and uh, so we've got quite a quite a lot of webinars under under our belt here um, and really you know really excited about continuing the HR um, best practices series so if you're new to it welcome on the right side you'll see a uh, where you can type a message. You're welcome to type a message uh, in in there. If I don't get to the to the question that you have, then um, I'd invite you. Well, I'm sorry, I wouldn't invite you, but I will um, then circle back to you and send out uh, the Q and A to everybody. A lot of times we kind of get to these these questions during the webinar through the presentation as it as it evolves. But um, if we don't cover your question, we will we will uh, respond to the Q and A and send it around to everybody afterward. If you need HRCI or SHRM credits, uh, and you you know if you did mention make note of that when you registered uh, after the the webinar, we will send out the certifications um, by email to everybody. If you didn't note that you needed the webinars or the uh, credits then uh, for the webinar, then uh, just shoot us an email or give us a call and we'll make sure to uh, to get you the the certification. Um, really excited about this month's presentation. It's um, you know every year when we kind of brainstorm as uh, our our labor and employment section at the Thompson Co. and we brainstorm what topics to do? Uh, this was one that um, you know one of our uh, uh, newer, younger uh, associates had come up with, and um, you know there's just not a lot of webinars out there about about emojis. It's uh, you know it's just an interesting topic, I think, and really what emojis are are really no different ultimately, and we'll talk about this, but really emojis are no different than just symbols. Uh, they're just a different form of form of speech. They're just kind of a newer one that people use. Now, a lot of times people use emojis uh, without real knowledge of what they sometimes mean to people. I, you know, that's not new. Uh, people use language all the time. People do things with their you know, hands and bodies and stuff, gestures and gyrations and everything that mean one thing to one person and and don't mean um, you know, and, and mean another thing to somebody else. So emojis are really just a different a different form uh, that we see language language taking. But I think it's really important for HR professionals and lawyers and and business owners in this space to understand because I do think that. Uh, over the next, you know, over the, I don't know how long emojis as a, as a um, communication device, how long it's going to continue. I suspect it's going to only increase going forward. We seem to be changing the nature of how we speak because of texting and uh, primarily because of texting. Um, and so the use of emojis really just, you know, it's a symbol and it just means a lot of things. And it's just a shortened way of speaking and people seem to be shortening the way that they're speaking. So I suspect we're going to be only seeing an increase in emojis and what that means. And we'll talk about that in the context of worse workplace harassment. Uh, we certainly could talk about it in the same context uh, as um, not just harassment, but also discrimination, because there's, you know, what if somebody could make up an emoji that um, that is a, uh, you know, that another person would find racially or religiously offensive. I am certain that there are those emojis out there already. So let's talk a little bit um, about Me Too, sexual harassment. This webinar, the context of this webinar is as a, a harassment in the workplace, sexual harassment primarily in the workplace webinar. For those of you who have, have seen the other um, workplace harassment webinars and presentations that I've done, this will be, you know, this is kind of the brother or the sister presentation to that. We're just going to look at it from the uh, from the context and the flavor of 
emojis and what emojis mean in the, in the workplace. But at the core of it, we're still going to be talking about harassment and we're going to be talking about state and federal Title VII harassment and also discrimination laws and how state and federal law prohibits harassment in the workplace. So we'll talk about Me Too, how Me Too is, has been has has impacted that conversation that we've had with harassment. And then we'll also talk about just harassment and what it is and the differences between quid pro quo and and uh, coworker harassment and hostile work environment, which is something we all often hear. And so we need to understand how to distinguish between those. Um, and we'll talk about emojis and the use of language and strategies, investigation, uh, and some hypotheticals. And well, if you're like me, you may even, oh, you know, may, maybe there are some emoji experts out there. I will tell you that um, every day, you know, I am uh, learning for better or worse what some of these emojis emojis mean. Um, and so, you know, I'm uh, Gen X. And so I, you know, text all the time and use emojis all the time, but I had no real concept until, uh, you know, I don't know, nine months or or so ago that um that emojis in, in a sexual context and harassment context and discriminate discriminatory context that they had such meaning for people and people were using it. and of course it makes total sense but you know i'm i'm learning every day <laughs> for better or worse what all these emojis emojis do and can mean for people so i'm Maybe you're like me too, or maybe I'm just super naive to this, to this stuff. Uh, but I do have a 14 year old at home, and so that's actually he's teaching me quite a quite a bit about um, about all of all of that. And again, all for better or worse. So let's talk about me too. Uh, we are in the main reason I beside the fact that we're doing harassment, hostile work environment type of webinar here. Um, one of the main reasons that I wanted to talk about me too is because um, it's we're a year out. So it's August 2019, and that is about a year ago, almost entire, exactly a year ago, that we had the whole Harvey Weinstein stuff come out. And there was, look, there's been stuff in the media and, and the news about sexual harassment in the workplace for years and years and decades, uh, going back to Anita, Anita Hill when, when it really kind of hit the public consciousness. Uh, um, so... With Harvey Weinstein, though, it seemed to have kind of taken on a lot more, um, a lot more energy, and really just kind of, and probably because there was, it was he was such a big figure in Hollywood, and Hollywood types tend to be pretty vocal about causes, and so it's not terribly surprising that um, that you know so much energy was put into trying to really do something about about Me Too and harassment in the workplace in particular um, with regard to females. So we're about a year out. There's been a lot, a lot of movement on this. I'm sure, you know, your workplace hopefully has done training. If you haven't, you really should do training at least annually. Um, but if you're doing it every other year, that's probably okay as well. There should be some sort of sexual harassment, at least at a minimum of 5, 10, 15 minute review of your harassment policy in your handbook. If you don't have a harassment policy in the handbook, you must have a harassment policy in your handbook or at least some sort of separate policy. You need to have a protocol for legal purposes. You need to have a protocol in place for um, for the uh, uh, employees to make make complaints. Otherwise, you're, you're putting your company at, at uh, quite a bit of legal risk for coworker harassment. So, We've seen a lot more training. We've seen, you know, people a good opportunity for employers to go in and review their their handbooks and their policies on harassment, and and we've just seen a lot more, um, uh, you know, recognition of harassment and and less tolerance, I would say, of it too. And again, I'm being general. I'm sure there are a lot of workplaces where harassment's rampant, um, and and it's just you know continues to be a, a problem, and nothing has changed. But I think we're seeing a lot more. It's just in the public eye. It's something that's talked about. It's talked about on on nightly um, you know comedy shows. It's talked about in the news quite a bit. There's a lot of you know New York Times articles about this, and and other journalism obviously about it as well. And although things have slowed down a little bit, a lot of people have lost their careers. A lot of people have lost their wealth. A lot of people have lost their reputations. Uh, dozens and dozens of, and dozens of 
people who are you know famous for Hollywood or business or politics have have lost a lot and have have had their comeuppance as a result of um, and, you know allegations and you know let's just assume they're true uh, you know situations that they've that they've committed in ways that they've behaved toward in particular women though there are some um, women uh, harassment situations out there as well. But pr predominantly, we're talking about male harassment of females. And we're primarily talking about it in a workplace context. So when we talk about Harvey Weinstein, going back to him, and we talk about what he was doing, and just to remind everybody of the phenomenal story that, um, you know, is the Harvey Weinstein uh, thing, he, for the most part, you know, just kind of boiling this down, he, for the most part, was using as it's alleged, uh, his power and his role and ownership uh, running of a, uh, what I think, a movie production studio. So in Hollywood. So he was using that to elicit favors. So if we take a look at the first little emoji there, little zipper um, type thing, you know, be, be silent. Um, I think that's what that means. It might mean something entirely different. <laughs> So I'm, again, I'm not necessarily an emoji expert per se. I think they are oftentimes open for interpretation. But anyway, you've got the the silence, and in my mind, that's silence anyway, uh, emoji. And so what, um, you know, what Harvey Weinstein was doing was demanding a sexual favor. So quid pro quo, this for that. So, you know, you come, you know, take your clothes off give me a massage, whatever he was, he was doing, you know, have sex with me, whatever it is. Um, you do that for me in a sexual context. This is entirely sexual. It's not just like, you know, go get me the newspaper or something. There's sexual context behind what he was doing and, and a lot of others out there. And so that's quid pro quo. So you do this for me of a sexual context, and then I will do something for you. I will make you a movie star. I will put you in my movie. I will give you some money, whatever it is. So that's quid pro quo. Um, in the like real world, like non-work world, that is um, not illegal by any means. But in a work context, we we have seen over the last year, and again, way be way more than a year, but in the last year, it's been in the public eye, a lot of very famous people abusing their authority um, over over subordinates, and that's just straight up quid pro quo. It's going to ultimately. It's going to violate if that's if that's how it plays out. It's going to violate federal law, probably state law as well, depending on what state you're in. And because the person is like a Harvey Weinstein is a manager or an executive, but some sort of agent of the company, if they're a manager or an executive or even a supervisor, they're going to be an agent of the company. And like I always say, whatever agents do for the company, that puts that is like the company doing it. So when Harvey Weinstein is asking for sexual favors and he's giving people movie, uh, you know, movie roles and everything like that, that's quid pro quo harassment that makes his movie studio libel. So he is protected um, by recipient bondi at superior legal doctrine that basically says he's working within the context of, as an agent of the employer. Therefore, the employer is the one under Title VII. And most in a lot of uh, state laws, that's going to be libel. So he does all this stuff, and basically, you're looking at at his movie studio being the one that's going to have to ultimately settle uh, settle up these these demands. And I think there already has been a lot of money exchanged on this. So that's quid pro quo. So that's the one I think people get the most. It's if you look at the at the situations that have come to light the last uh, year, in particular. You are almost all the ones that have become really popular, really famous, uh, are the ones that are quid pro quo. Like I am abusing my authority as a manager, supervisor, owner of a company. I am using that authority to then elicit sexual something, favors, whatever, from a subordinate employee. Quid pro quo. I'm using it. I'm getting an advantage of it. If that happens, the company is pretty much automatically going to be liable for any sort of lawsuit, any sort of violation of Title VII or, or state state laws. And it could be, you know, you could have the, um, the benefit to the employee, could be a raise, could be avoidance of being terminated, 
could be a number of things, but for the most part, it's tied to the job. That's generally how we see quid pro quo. Hostile work environment is more nuanced. Hostile work environment is going to be not this for that. Hostile work environment is going to be, hey, um, look at my computer and check out the pornography that I'm looking at. That'd be pretty cool if that were you and me, right? That's that's hostile work environment. Hostile work environment is calling somebody names repeatedly over normally over a period of time. Could be uh, discrimination, could be harassment, could be gender based, could be sex based. Um, but we when we're talking about sexual hostile work environment, it's some sort of unwelcome conduct. Now it's going to have to be unwelcome because a lot of a lot a lot of people are really really sensitive and that's not it's not judgment call on my part it's just some people are more sensitive if you were to say something to me um more likely than you know compared to somebody who's really sensitive i probably i might not find it offensive but the person next to me might find it offensive subjectively in order for it to be a hostile work environment it has to be subjectively offensive to the person on the receiving end so if you were to say something to me and i'd be like well whatever that doesn't you know i don't care doesn't do anything for me i'm not offended by that um then it's not subjectively offensive to me so i'm i really don't have a case for a hostile work environment harassment if you say something offensive to a coworker and that coworker same thing and that coworker is uh, offended by it well that's you know that's um that's subjectively offensive to them so that could be the basis for a hostile work environment however we also have to look at at objective uh, objectiveness is it objectively harassing and that's where we when we talk about emojis that i think there's so much there's so much ambiguity in here and we'll really have to see over the next several years how the law works around these emojis and these symbols because the subjective stuff if i see if i see um you know some somebody sends me an emoji with some peaches and we'll talk about some emojis but let's just pretend like all fruit could potentially have a sexual type of meaning uh to it if the person intends it as such and if somebody says to me like an emoji with some peaches that does it's not really going to do a whole lot for me but if they send it to somebody else and that person's like oh i know what you're talking about like that's really offensive like i don't like the fact that you just sent me sent me some peaches you're referring to you know my butter or whatever and okay well that that person's finding it offensive now but for it to be hostile work environment we, we have to also look at the objectiveness. Would a reasonable person find it offensive? And that's where I think there's going to be there's going to have to be so much coming coming out in the cases um, in the next in the next several years. Because is it objectively offensive to just text a coworker an emoji of a peach? And a peach again um, for those of you who aren't entirely familiar, like I wasn't about peaches until recently um peaches would would be like like a uh, like a butt so apple probably is as well basically a lot of fruit could just have some sort of sexual con connotation to it so um if i know that and if i get something from a peach and it's like oh what? okay like i don't care but if somebody else does and they do care well the question then goes to be fine it's not if for them for the other coworker. It's subjectively it's offensive to them, but would it be would a reasonable person find a coworker texting a peach to them, just just a peach? Um, would that be objectively offensive? And I don't know. I don't know the I don't know the answer to it. I think some of it is going to be legal. You're going to have to look at the the frequency of it and if there's anything else attached to it is this like just the one in a long line i think more likely than not because a hostile work environment has to be pervasive it has to be severe um and so a peach symbol is probably not i really legally don't think it ultimately is going to be enough but could it be part of an ongoing series of things maybe there's also some touching involved maybe there's a text every day maybe there's a text every hour maybe maybe they're they went on some dates the date it didn't work out but then there's this constant badgering texts 
peaches and bananas and eggplants and, you know, all these crazy texts and winky eyes, a little like, you know, heart love symbols and stuff like that. And, you know, maybe, maybe this, the pervasiveness of it is enough. I can see a context where emojis are absolutely brought in to help to paint the picture of a hostile work environment. It's probably not just going to be enough standalone to say that I'm feeling threatened, it's severe enough, you know, but in the overall context of what we see with harassment uh, that often occurs when somebody is legitimately being harassed by one person, that it, it, you know, there's not, it's not just one-offs. One-offs probably aren't going to create an uh, illegal situation, um, unlawful situation, but they are more likely than not going to be part of an overall story about harassment and hostile uh, hostility in the workplace. And again, so hostile, we've got hostile work environment, very different than quid pro, pro quo. And as you can tell by the hostile work environment, it gets into the facts. It gets into a lot into the situation and what are the facts and the nuances and how is somebody perceiving this and what was intended by it. If I send a peach, not knowing that a peach or a banana has some sort of, you know, sexual connotation, then you know, it, I'm sorry if the person takes offense to it. Like literally, I I might have been entirely ignorant of of the intent. That's not going to excuse me if I'm if I'm being investigated by a company. The company could still come in and say, "Hey, knock it off. Here's what that just did. You're not. You know, that doesn't mean that I couldn't get disciplined or something just because I'm ignorant of it. But from a legal standpoint." it probably isn't going to be sufficient in of itself to create a hostile work environment. So let's talk about some of the emojis. So emojis are just being used a lot. I, I think I think it's great that you're on this this uh, call and I think it's great that that you're uh, taking some initiative to get into this because I think, you know, HR HR is always looking for like the next thing uh, to, to talk about. And a couple of years ago, it was, you know, conversations with millennials and millennials in the workplace. And I think those those are still really good conversations to have. And we just did a recent webinar on it several months back. But um, I think, you know, that topic, I think it's kind of working as, you know, I think people have been sufficiently trained on it, though I know there's still communication issues that need to need to occur in a lot of workplaces. But I think emojis are kind of one of these newer newer things. We did uh, a webinar a few months ago on on the use of animals in the in the workplace um, as like service animals and therapy animals and stuff like that. I think that's going to be there's going to be an increasing amount of of um, law around that in the next several years. But I think emojis, emojis in the context of a harassment investigation, hostile work environment, I think they're going to continue to be uh, very relevant for HR professionals. So congratulations. And I applaud you for for being on, uh, you know, getting some training, training on this. Um, like I said at the beginning, emojis, the way I look at emojis are really no different than we just look at symbols. Um, you know, cavemen were using symbols on the on the caves and everything. Um, it's just a different form of form of speech. It um, and it's becoming incredibly pre prevalent. I use emojis all the time. Now, I pretty much always use the same emoji, the little smiley face. I know it's super professional for a lawyer to say that, but I kind of, but I do. And I'm like, you know, that's fine. I can communicate like, like everybody else. I don't have to be super stuffy, but so I'll use, I'll use smiley face emojis periodically when the context makes sense. Uh, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, maybe I've probably used the winky, uh, you know, not in a sexual type of context, but maybe just, uh, I don't know, it's like you get it or something like that, like a little winky emoji. But the emojis are developing. There's going to be an increasing amount of emojis out there. I'm not suggesting that you try to keep up with it all. I think that would be a, a lot of effort and with probably not a lot of reward. But expect that as HR, expect that as business owners that you're just going to continue to see uh, the development of emojis. Um, you may want to talk to your IT people if you start to see this in emails and everything. You might want to just talk to your IT people to just periodically, like maybe once a year, just go through and make sure that no crazy emojis have creeped into your, um, you know, whatever your email uh, uh, program uh, software is that you're that you're using, or or even um, like your uh, word processing type of type of software, just to make sure some new ones weren't created that are entirely inappropriate um, uh, for the for the workplace. That's a good idea. I, I would 
I would think, though I think a lot of that's going to be dictated by the software you're using. Um, interesting that we are starting to see a real ramp up, certainly as a percentage. I don't think this is a terrible surprise for anybody here. Uh, we're starting to see a real ramp up of lawsuits and charges of discrimination. And so here you can take a you can take a look. And so as a percentage wise, we're not talking about a ton of of lawsuits right now, but it's increasing. And and it's um, and again, I just. I think, you know, and these are just lawsuits where it's coming up. These are just charges of discrimination. I'm sorry, it's just lawsuits right here, not charges. Um, I think this is going to increase, but I think outside of lawsuits, I think that on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, a lot of HR professionals are, are, if they haven't yet, they're going to start to be dealing with emojis and complaints from coworkers that they're getting texts about it. They're getting texts with emojis. And they're getting emails from co from you know coworkers and supervisors and everything with emojis. And I one of the issues with emojis is because they are symbols and there's no like there's no definition. When I st when I've started getting into this and starting to have clients call on the on the hotline and talk about emojis, and when I started to look into it, well, I literally have to start googling the emoji to find out exactly what the like street definition is of of that and no surprise the definitions are not always clear um i don't think that's going to surprise anybody and so that makes it increasingly difficult to kind of govern and policy around this because again i might use the winky emoji in a professional context um in in a work related email thinking like, oh, we, you know, we just solved this problem, you know, wink, like we're on it or something. That would be my, my use of it. Somebody else might see it as come from a completely different perspective. And I can't go to the dictionary and say, here's the, no, 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 here's like what the winky emoji means. We sometimes see this with language, particularly language um, that might have a discriminatory context. And I don't want to get too deeply into this, but there are some words that that have a legitimate non-racial type of meaning, but people they they sound weird. They sound they sound bad. I will give you an example um, from high school for me. So I uh, I had this um, English teacher. She was absolutely fantastic, and um, and I was in high school around when the Anita Hill thing thing came up. I'm I'm just remembering that was the context. And so we were having this this conversation about harassment in the in the workplace. And she was very religious and she um she said, you know, it's uh harassment. She refused she refused to say harassment because she she felt like that just was inappropriate to say in a school context. And so she would always say her harassment and then you know the rest of us of course would say harassment but not in her class like we would say it out outside but she didn't want there to be like any potential swearing um with the pronunciation of harassment so different contexts um there are other words that that have a legitimate meaning that sound bad whether it's harassment or something like that and and people use them but that doesn't mean so even though they have a legitimate meaning, that doesn't mean that they're appropriate necessarily to use in the workplace. And so um, there are just those those words out there that even though they're legitimate, right words, that doesn't mean that they're appropriate to use because because you know that other people might not know what the real word is. They might not understand that, hey, I'm not saying something racial. I'm not saying something against religion. I'm not being profane here. This is like I'm this is just a word that that you might not know, but I'm just using it. And so we just have to kind of govern ourselves. Emojis are just really, really difficult because there's no set definition of them. They're open for interpretation. They're open for context. And I think that's just why there's going to drive so much more harassment and discrimination and misunderstanding in in uh, the workplace. So good news for employers. We always, you know, say the good news for the employers is that employers have been winning. Um, they've been able to defend themselves in these hostile work environment harassment lawsuits where um, where emojis are, are part of the context of the overall harassment hostile work environment. And this is typical. Employers normally win these, win, uh, win these hostile work environment harassment 
uh, cases, it's hard. Um, it's hard. This it's hard to prove for employees that their work environment was was severe and pervasive enough with harassment and hostility that um, that it affected a term or condition of of employment. So uh, employers win on that on that difficult definition all the time. Little colon p. Um, Michigan court concluded that a comment that included an emoticon of a face with its tongue sticking out couldn't be views, viewed as defamatory. And again, we're looking at an objective context here, right? So I don't think I've ever used this emoji, but you know, I've used like the little colon, well, the smiley face, and then there's the colon, and then there's like a straight, you know, um, uh, mouth, so just a straight line, and then there's one there's like a little sadder. And then I have um, some friends who are German, and it always completely baffles me because they do the smiley face backward, and so it completely confuses me. And I always wonder, like, is that like I speak German, but this, like, uh, they don't say things backward. Um, so, anyway, they heads up that uh, if you have people working from you for you from different countries, that they might use the, the emoticons and the emojis entirely different. And it might have different contexts and, you know, or, or they could be offended because, because it's misunderstood. And again, this is just language. This is just people having misunderstandings and not explaining themselves to one another or just being open for interpretation. But we did have a favorable result from a Michigan court that found that just basically objectively sticking a tongue out uh, wouldn't be uh, def defamatory, which is really, really cool. Um so there we are. So there's the actual emojis versus just like the emoticons of uh, smiley faces, winky faces related to communication. Um, again, my intent is always to be, uh, you know, fun with with them, but definitely people might take it badly. And so maybe we just shouldn't use them. And I think that's a fair, that's even a fair, if you start to see this more in the workplace, and if you want to try to police around it, could you just tell people stop using uh, emojis, stop using emoticons? Absolutely. You know, you could, you know, on work time, absolutely. Using work computers, yes. They don't have free speech in the workplace. That doesn't exist. People say it, does, it doesn't exist. Um, could you stop them from texting outside work? No, not unless they're using a work phone. Um, you know, people can do what they you know, relatively what they want to do outside a workplace, but could you stop them from just say policy, no more emoticons, no more, it's open too much, too open for interpretation. We want to put a stop to it. Uh, don't do it. People are getting offended, whether it's necessarily or unnecessarily. So just knock it off. Yes, you could have that, have that sort of policy. I haven't seen those sorts of policies. I've never written one of those policies, but I can see them coming up in the future if this starts to if this continues to escalate and get out of control, so let's let's take a look at some examples um, that are that are out there. Uh, Todd's leave is up tomorrow, so this would be like you know communication in the you know between you know, like IMs or texts or whatever between coworkers. Okay, so Todd's leave is up tomorrow. I don't think he's going to be able to return right now. What should we do? Uh, okay, so if he doesn't. Uh, return, we terminate. This first, first of all, this is discoverable in the patent in a lawsuit. I would encourage everybody here, and then you might want to encourage all the staff that you're training and talking to that texts and IMs are just as discoverable as emails. If there's eventually a lawsuit, we should think of them the same. We should be as professional with them as the same. They never read well in context when lawyers are involved a year or so later. They're going to be read right out of context. That's what lawyers get paid to do when they're trying to sue companies is to miss is to screw around with the interpretation of communication that you've had. So think about it. Um, okay, so if he doesn't return, we terminate. This is a legitimate conversation about termination and you're talking about leave of absence. That could be protected by FMLA. And you're talking about terminating this shows intent this shows illegal unlawful intent potentially you don't want this sort of thing to come up you've got a little a little um hand gesture you know the little thumbs up sorry the the thumbs up and then the game over sign like game over we're gonna fire him well he's coming he's potentially coming off of a protected leave of absence 
you don't want this to be discovered. This is straight up lawsuit, <laughs> lawsuit game over, liability for the company, unlawful termination. If, if, you know, the person's coming off of uh, like a disability leave of absence or FMLA, something that's protected by, by law. And then you've got the little thumbs up saying, yeah, we should do it. These are two people in concert right now, you know, in this hypothetical, two people in concert that are, that are basically showing um, and, and agreeing on a potentially unlawful action. If this were to come up in a lawsuit, it would be, it would be uh, pretty, pretty damaging. Okay, so here's another one. A complaint, are you kidding me? She complains about everything. Yeah, I'll look into it. Then notice the little um, the little finger painted type type of thing. I don't know exactly what that means. I would have to Google it to see if there's like some sort of street definition of what that is. To me, I look at that and I say, um, she complains about everything. Yeah, I'll look into it. So that either the painting nails to me means that, um, like you're not going to going to do anything about it. You're just going to, you know, rather instead you're going to go paint your nails or it means that the, you're indicating that the person's a female and it some sort of stereotype about being a female. I literally, I do not know um, other than to look at it and to say it would be better without that, that uh, um, emoji in there. Right. So, I mean, it's unnecessary to tell the story here. So from a management perspective, from an HR perspective, we don't want to see it. It's open for interpretation. That's the ultimate problem. So then we've got the response. Mary came into my office today. Apparently, John's making suggested, suggestive comments about something she was wearing yesterday. Can you please look into this? I'll be out on vacation until until next week. So we've just got you know, trigger of a potential, of a potential investigation. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. And that was the first email. And then the response was, are you kidding me? She complains about everything. Yeah, I'll look into it. So that's, that's the context. That's the response to it. And again, painting the fingernails might mean I'm not really, you know, it's not a priority to me, or it might mean she's being some sort of prima donna. And uh, like I said, complaining about everything. So again, it hurts the situation. It looks like a bad way for HR to or management to respond to this. They're not taking it seriously. I'm going to read the emails in order this time. <laughs> so, uh, so person seriously, James called off again. So didn't come into work. What's the deal? Why does that surprise you? And then little wheelchair emojis. And again, why does that surprise you? Allows. Me, if I'm defending you as a as a lawyer in this law potential lawsuit from you know this uh, James who is let's just say suing suing you. If it says why does that surprise you? That's open for interpretation. I can get you at a deposition and I can get you to explain what you meant by that. You throw in the the handicap emoji, three of them, and that tells me right there what your thought was. Your thought was potentially illegal. You are, you are now identifying James as being disabled. Now, maybe you didn't mean anything by, by the handicap emoji. Maybe, maybe you just meant like, oh yeah, you know, he's got some disabilities. He's been, he's been missing work a lot, but that's not how I read it. You see the, uh, you see the emoji. It tells, it tells me as, as the lawyer, if there's a potential lawsuit here that you had some sort of um, unlawful discriminatory motivation. And I, I just don't like it. I think it adds, it adds a lot of liability for the, for the company and, um, and makes it really hard to defend, uh, in, you know, a company in this, uh, in some sort of disability type of lawsuit. Okay. Let's talk about some policies. So idea for social media, if you have a social media policy right now, you might want to consider uh, amending, adding to it, excuse me, including some, something about emojis, reminding employees about the blurred personal professional lines. This, when you're doing your harassment training, I think you're starting to incorporate stuff about emojis in the use of social media and texting and texting outside of uh, work, um, professional and non-professional stuff. I think this is all part of the conversation that we should be having when we're talking about harassment in the, in the workplace. If there's a conflict, 
If you want to say something about somebody, do it. Don't do it in writing. It's going to be discoverable. It's going to come up in a in a potential lawsuit. You don't want to be reeling when you when you see it, an email or an IM from from you with three handicap symbols on it or a banana and some fruit or something like that. There, you just you want to be able to have these constructive conversations and not be able to have like terrible documentation that shows your intent, particularly if if um, you know you're not you you've got uh, bad bad intent. Two different policies that might be necessary: one for each employee's personal social media channels. So if you're you know telling employees that hey, if you're on Facebook, you can't stop employees from being on Facebook outside work, right? But what you can do is you can stop them from talking badly about the company. Now you can't really stop them from complaining about the terms or conditions of their employment. The National Labor Relations Act protects that, but you can stop them from talking about the company and also from treating coworkers. If the treatment, whether it's social media or, or um, you know, in-person treatment, if outside of work, it somehow comes back into the workplace and impacts the workplace, well, then that's a, that's a real problem. And so you can actually, you know, take steps uh, to, to try to put a stop to it so that um, the workplace is productive and everything. And then also a policy, a social media policy that relates to the social media accounts, um, which hopefully you, you know, only a couple of people have, one or two people have access to at your company, depending on the size of it. So key points and policies. The key point I mentioned at the beginning when we is that we need to have a harassment policy. We need to have um, a reporting mechanism for this, and we have to have that reporting mechanism go to multiple people. We cannot just have a reporting mechanism that says, just take all of your complaints to the president or CEO. That's not gonna be enough. It's got, you know, supervisor, manager, HR, president, CEO is fine, obviously, board of directors, any other member of management. You wanna have multiple layers because what if you just have one person and that person is the harasser? then the policy is basically ineffectual and you're not you're not going to get the benefit of a potential legal defense on it so we definitely want to have multiple people in the potential reporting of these policies we want to have clear language prohibiting discrimination prohibiting bullying prohibiting the use of any sort of language including emojis you can mention emojis but a lot of harassment policies will give examples of how people get um, get, you know, uh, what's prohibited. And I know I was just doing a, a seminar last week and I had mentioned, uh, you know, on one of the slides, it talked about, um, pinups. I was like, yeah, pinups are so like 1950 and 1960, right? So I, you know, nobody under the age of like 30 probably knows what a pinup is. If anybody under the age of 50 even knows what a pinup is, but emo, you know, um, Computer screens, emojis, they're kind of like the new pinups, right? We pinups could be fine. You could have a pinup of like a mountain or something like that, a place that you've been. But a pinup, I think, normally has a con con uh, connotes some sort of like scantily clad female. And I think emojis and you know are just kind of the present day type of type of pinups. Um, policy should provide some examples. I would uh, encourage you to start to incorporate emojis into and, and emoticons into uh, those examples. Harassment policies, when you're creating your harassment policy and you're reviewing it, you need it to be more than just sexual harassment. We generally talk about sexual harassment, but racial harassment, age harassment, um, national origin, any of these protected classes, they're just as illegal uh, to be harassing. If somebody's being harassed because they're Catholic in the workplace, that's just as illegal as if somebody's being harassed because of their gender. Same with any protected protected class. And so here are several of the protected classes. There are several more. It depends on the state. A lot of states have have um, different protected classes. Minnesota has, you know, unique in, in that um, Minnesota has, uh, um, if somebody's on medical assistance, it's pro, it's uh, protected. So no making, I, I always feel like there was somebody in the legislature that was once on medical, uh, on um, public assistance, I'm sorry. So was once receiving, you know, like uh, 
um, like food stamps or something like that. And then became a legislator and then just said, you know, I really did not like being made, <laughs> made fun of for it. And, uh, and, you know, added it to the Minnesota Human Rights Act to make it prohibited that you can't make fun of people discriminate, harass against them because of their receipt of public assistance. So anyway, pr any protected class, your policy needs to be much broader than just sexual harassment. Let's talk about the flow of investigation. Um, then we'll do a quick example and then I think we're done. Uh, so we've got the investigation flow. So here's what I recommend doing. You might have some extra steps in here. That's fine. But when I look at in uh, harassment investigations, this is how, you know, you've got, you've got some complaints about emojis or harassment or what people said, whatever it is. This is what I generally do. Person comes to you. Normally it's a person comes to you and they say, Hey, this and that and the other happened. I don't really like it. Uh, you know what to, you know, here's my story. So the first thing to do is to get the person's narrative, get the full story, ask a lot of questions write it down, have the employee as part of this process, write down their narrative. They either write it down or you in HR or as a business owner or a lawyer, you write it down and then have them sign off on it. We want to lock them into a narrative. And the reason is because, well, first of all, so that you can understand and it's really, really clear what the sit what the situation is that you need to investigate sometimes we just we forget when we're when we're told things if we don't write them down so it's good to have a document the second thing is we we want that employee to give us all the information right away so that more stuff in the future is not added once they get legal counsel if that's the the direction that it goes we don't want the story to to suddenly explode just because their lawyer thought that they'd get a lot more money by suing the company uh, with a more explosive story. So we want to lock them into a narrative to help with the investigation, but also to fully understand uh, and lock them into uh, a story for legal purposes. Then we want to determine the nature of the investigation. Is this looking like it's going to be quid pro quo? Is it looking like uh, sexual um, sexual harassment, hostile work environment. What is the type of investigation? Is this going to be sex? Is it race? Is it age? And maybe, you know, it'll, it'll come out as, as you go through with the, with the, uh, um, investigation, but you want to have a general understanding. Is this the sort, is the nature of this investigation that somebody is put in harm's way? If somebody's put in harm's way, you should be taking, you, you want to do everything you can to make it a safe working environment and to be able to have a safe place to do your investigation. Sometimes that means putting the accused on a leave of absence. It could be paid, it could be unpaid, it could be unpaid uh, until the investigation concludes and if the in investigation exonerates the person, then you pay them. So that often is something that you need to do right up front. And you could even tell the person like, it doesn't mean that we're finding against you. It doesn't mean we've made conclusions here, but given the nature of the allegations, we're worried about future harm and we need to protect the company ultimately, which also means protecting employees. And so sometimes that just means putting somebody on a leave of absence to get, to get them out of the workplace uh, to best um, protect you as a company. We then want to review everything. So we've got the narrative, we've determined the nature of this, and then we're going to investigate. We're going to talk to the accused. We're going to you know, interview, talk to them, get their side of the story. We're going to talk to and interview any uh, potential witness. We're going to review emails. We're going to look at those emojis. We're going to, in, we're going to talk about it. We might have to circle back to all these people once we get some documents and say, well, what exactly did you mean by that eggplant banana emoji that you sent, um, you know, at one o'clock in the morning to your coworker on text. I mean, what exactly were you, were you implying by, by that, you know, get the story, um, get the, uh, and find out and ask questions and get the documents, especially with emojis, there's going to be a paper trail. So get the paper trail, do the investigation, collect all the facts, collect all the, the information, and then analyze it. And then we're going to look at it. We're going to see what's our policy, what's our past practice on this. Have we, 
what you know how do we feel about these emojis how do we feel about this the symbols the the statements that were used here are we um, is this going to be a violation of our policy normally you're looking at your discrimination your anti-discrimination and, and anti-harassment policy and then you're going to you're going to um, act appropriately and you're going and you're you know in a situation where it might be a hostile work environment harassment that might continue if left if the person's left in the workplace, you probably are going to get rid of that person. You why put yourself at risk for future harm, even if you can uh, put a stop to the to the current situation with one employee? Do you really want to leave somebody who's who's a harasser in the workplace to harass somebody else in the future? Probably not. It seems to me like a lot of potential liability for a company to take on. Is it fairly innocuous? Somebody used a winky face emoji. And another person took offense to it. There was you find out through the investigation that no harm was done. Eh, okay. Have a talk about the use of emojis. Maybe put a stop to the use of emojis. Doesn't mean that you need to fire somebody over it. So you're gonna take the you're gonna take everything you're going to, and then you're going to make sure um, and see what uh, what the appropriate uh, thing to do based on that is. In the next few slides, actually get more into the weeds on exactly what I just said. So again, first we're going to assess the allegations, try to figure out the narrative, do the nature and figure out the nature, put somebody on leave of absence, and then here's how we gather the facts. And here's a more specific breakdown of the different phases that we have with gathering the facts. Again, look at the emails, talk to talk to people, maybe, maybe circle back, try to get their idea, their impression about what they were looking for. Um, and then assure everybody who's participating that there's not going to be any retaliation. If you've got a team of people on the investigation, I mean, not every investigation needs lawyers. A lot of them do, um, but because they're they're serious and they put the company potentially at risk. But two people could be HR and a supervisor or an HR and ex an executive um, are often fine. I, I do recommend two people ideally do an investigation if you have the resources. Uh, to do that, and then keeping the investigation confidential. Investigation Investigative notes normally are not put into personnel files. They're kept with managers or they're kept with HR. You could put it in the personnel file, but normally you don't have to. And um, In Minnesota, we have a personnel file law that, that specifically says that um, investigative notes from a harassment claim aren't part of a personnel file. And one of the reasons for that is because a lot of state laws, states um, require that employees, uh, require that employers provide access to the employee personnel file to employees. And you don't want an employee to ask to see their personnel file, get a copy of it, and then see like all these investigative notes where they're talking to their coworkers as part of this investigation. Then suddenly the, the employee gets pretty angry with their coworkers and it, it becomes just a real thing. We want there to be some sort of confidentiality. So again, we talked about the analysis, call legal counsel. That's always the best thing you can do um, <laughs> to call legal counsel. And again, the response, um, the key is that you prohibit future conduct. Okay, so let's just take a take a look at this one. So how would we, you know, just addressing this situation, we've got this intern, right? So intern says, hey, person responds, what's up? Did you see the new intern? Oh yeah, like heart, uh, face, Four, I guess four um, thumbs up are better than three. So there's some sort of like thumbs up exclamation point basically. And then like little kissy emoji. Okay. So imagine a situation where, you know, this intern in the, you know, around the same time comes to you in HR and says, I'm not, I'm just, I didn't like um, the way that, you know, somebody put their hand on my shoulder, this coworker, let's just, call the person Mark. Mark put his hand on my, on my shoulder and, um, you know, asked me out on a, on a date. And then John also said something about, you know, inappropriate about my, um, dress and, you know, whatever. So I don't really like it. Could you look into it? Okay. So HR looks into it and finds this, right. And finds this interaction. And again, this is going to doom, Mark and John. So Mark and John are seen 
um, you know, HR gets this as part of their investigation. They decide they're going to interview Mark. They get the narrative from the employee, right, from the intern. They get the narrative, lock it down, put, uh, put it down in writing, and get the intern to sign off on it. Then they go and they talk to Mark and John. And Mark and John say what, whatever they're going to say, like, you know, no or yes or probably, you know, whatever they're going to say. So let's just say they deny it. Okay. So you've got a he said, she said, or two, two he saids and, and one she said. Then you're going to start gathering some facts. Check some emails. You find on IM that that this went went down a couple days before the complaint came in. Okay, this gives you more to go back to Mark and John with. You go back to Mark and John. What did you mean by the thumbs up and the little heart eyes? What did you mean, um, John? Mark, what did you mean by the kissy the kissy face? Um, this seems to undercut your denials that that you were hit weren't hitting on. Uh, on this new intern, right? So it's going to doom them. They're, it's going to doom their credibility. They're going. They're probably in this type of situation going to have to fess up uh, because I don't think there's a lot of ambiguity here. They're probably going to fess up that that yeah, they think the, they're attracted to the person and something like that. So there's probably going to be some sort of discipline that occurs for Mark and John. I'm not saying that termination is necessarily the way to go on this one, but you as an, as a company need to then um, analyze it, analyze it against your past practice. So you've done, so, you know, going back, you're, you're doing the narrative, you're doing the fact gathering, the investigation, you get the, the um, documents, you circle back, you come down to making a decision. You've got the facts. You don't think Mark and John are credible based on this, these emojis and everything, I think that's, that's uh, appropriate. And so then you're trying to analyze it and figure out the appropriate response. Look at your past practice, look at your policy, you prohibit harassment, discrimination in the workplace. You find that these guys, you, you know, judgment call, because there's no real proof other than you, where well, you've got this IM, but there's no real proof that they hit on her and other than her own statement on it. And then you just decide what to do. And it might be, you know, putting Mark and John in a different department. It might mean a counseling session. It might mean suspension without pay. It uh, could be termination. Maybe this isn't the first time for Mark and John. Um, it might mean termination for John because it's the second time for him. It might mean a suspension for Mark because it's the first time for him. So you have to figure out what to do with it. But that's just generally the process. Um, and again, this sort of stuff, these sorts of emails and texts and I am, this happens every day. It happens every day in the workplace. And, um, and I think you're just going to, in HR, you're just going to, you know, the key for you is to make sure that you have a protocol and then you follow the investigative steps here in, um, in re reviewing these very similar to how you do it with other, uh, harassment. But I think there's a lot more ambiguity because of the use of emojis and emoticons. And I think we're going to see that play out with lawsuits, um, uh, in the indefinite future. I really appreciate your attention today. Thanks for uh, attending. If you have any uh, follow-up questions uh, or have any, you know, want to talk about any of this, feel free to give me or any of your Thompson Co. attorneys a call. Um, again, my name is Kevin Mosier, and I wish you a good month, and we will talk again on the HR uh, Best Practices in September. Thank you.